Uh, good morning everyone. The Department of Psychology welcomes all of you here as we observe our very first World Brain Day. Uh, we are so happy to see our HOD Dr. Nuzinino here, our faculties from all the different departments and our very dear students. So the World Brain Day is the brainchild of the World Federation of Neurology with its aim of fostering quality neurology and brain health worldwide. The theme for this year is Brain Health for All. We are going to be have we will have a case presentation by our faculty, Assistant Professor Melody Sharma. Next, we will have uh, video presentations by our students, uh, Kenny, Lika, Hamshen, and Muamela. After which, we will have a uh, quiz. So the quiz masters will be Muamela and Muakala. After that, we will be having uh, another presentation by our students, uh, third semester students. Uh, they will be presenting on the structure of neuron by uh, Naomi, Naomi Machoni and Mercy. We will also be having a presentation by our first semester students, Hengwa Le and Sunti Naro. After which, I Wandango Lota will be presenting on the optimal brain development, some few tips on how to keep our brain healthy. So this program is, uh, we will be focusing on awareness and advocacy for brain health. And I hope you all enjoy the program. A very good morning, Wandango. I am Naomi of Third semester will be presenting on the topic neuron along with my friends Mercy and Marjorie. So basically, what are neurons? Neurons are also known as nervous system. Neurons are a fundamental unit of the nervous system specialized to transmit information to different parts of the body. What is neuron? Neurons are the building blocks of the nervous system. They receive and transmit signals to different parts of the body. This is carried out in both physical and electrical forms. There are several types of neurons that facilitate the transmission of information. The sensory neurons carry information from the sensory receptors, cells present throughout the body or the brain. Now I'll be talking about the functions of neurons. Neurons are information processing unit of the brain which have responsibility for sending units of brain, which have a responsibility for sending, receiving and transmit, transmitting electrochemical signals throughout the body. Neurons, also known as nerve system, are essentially the cell that make up the brain and the nervous system. The function of neuron is to transmit nerve impulses along the length of an individual. Neurons will cause the synapse into their next neuron. The central neuron system, which comprises the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral neural system, which consists of sensory and motor nerve cells, all condense this information processing unit. According to the new research, the human brains contain 86 billion neurons. These cells develop around fully. Around the time of the birth, but unlike other cells, cannot reproduce or regenerate once they die. Now I give time to Mercy and Mutoni. about the structure of the neuron. So neuron comes uh, comes in many shapes and varieties according to the specialized uh, they performed. So uh, there are four basic uh, neuron structure. There are four basic neuron structure. Uh, the, the soma which is also called the cell bodies, um, the, the, uh, the dendrites, uh, the axons and uh, the axons uh, Axons and the axons terminal, so soma. Soma, which is also called the cell bodies, uh, is essentially the core of the neuron, uh, the central of the neuron. Uh, this cell provides information, contains uh, genetic information, uh, genetic information, but the neurons, uh, they maintain the neuron structure uh, and provides energy to drive activities. The cell, uh, like other uh, cell bodies of neurons, uh, soma contains nucleus and uh, specialized organelles, the dendrites. The dendrites, um, the, de the dendrites is a um, branch of structure uh, shape, shaped like a tree, uh, tree roots, and uh, it's it's more of a, like a, a tree, uh, tree roots. Uh, the 
the process of uh, the method of this is uh, to transmit information from another neuron and to uh, to to receive to receive information from another neuron and transmit um, and transmit electrical signals from the cell bodies. Uh, the third is the ex, uh, the axons. So uh, the axons is a long slender uh, tube covered by a uh, millennial sheet. So millennial sheet uh, uh, is a layer of uh, is a feed and protein uh, uh, web, uh, around the nerves. And the axons, as you can see, is a long uh, slender tube uh, which uh, which is read uh, around the nerves by the uh, feeds and uh, the proteins. Uh, and this axon carry um, signals away from the cell bodies to, to the terminal bottoms and lastly the terminal bo bodies uh, bottom. Uh, here the terminal uh, uh, here the terminal bottom located at the end uh, of the neuron as you can see here and the purpose of this is uh, for transmitting and uh, for signal uh, from the other neurons. So these are the four basic uh, structure of the neuron. Hi, good morning everyone, respected teachers in my fellow maths. Today I'll be talking about the types of neurons. Before that, I'll be briefing out what this neuron is, as my friend had explained about it, but in a very simple term. The neurons are a basic constituent of the brain, vibral spinal cord and vertebral nerve cord, and the peripheral ganglion, which is a mass and nerve cell bodies. And in a very more simple term, neurons are responsible for carrying out information throughout the human body using electrical and chemical signal. They help coordinate all of our necessary function of life. So uh, neurons can be categorized into three types, that is sensory neuron, motor neuron, and interneuron. Firstly, let's look into sensory neuron. Sensory neurons are the nerve cells that are activated by the sensory input from the environment. For example, when you touch a hot surface with your fingertip, the sensory neuron will be the one firing the sending of signal to the rest of the nervous system uh, about the information they have received. The input that active sensory, uh, sensory neurons can be physical or chemical, corresponding to all of our five, sen five senses. Thus, a physical input can be things like sound, touch, heat or light. A chemical input comes from taste or smell which neurons then send to the brain. Most sensory neurons are pseudonipolar which means they only have one exon. The exon is there. One exon N. Which means they only have one exon which is split into two branches. The second type of neuron is the motor neuron. This is the motor neuron. Most neurons of Motor neurons of the spinal cord are part of central nervous system and connect to muscle, glands, and organs throughout the body. This neuron transmits impulses from the spinal cord to skeletal and smooth muscles like in the, our stomachs. And so directly control of our muscle movements. There are in fact two types of motor neurons. These that travel from spinal cord to muscle are also called lower motor. Whereas those who travel between brain and spinal cord are called upper motor neurons. Motor neurons have the most common type of human body plan. For nervous cell, there are multipolar, each will one exon and several dendrites. Lastly, the last more neuron is interneuron. As the name suggests, interneurons are one in the between they connect spinal motor and sensory neuron as well as transferring signal between sensory and motor neuron. Interneuron can also communicate with each other, forming circuit of various complexity. They are multipolar, just like motor neuron. Conclusion, in conclusion, the neuron does form the basic functional unit of the nervous system, transmitting and receiving the neural impulses to and from the various part of the body to the central nervous system. Thank you. Thank you students for a very 
aptly presenting the function and structure of the neurons. Uh, now we will have a video presentation by our students. So in order to understand the brain, we also need to understand the development. So the students of third semesters have done a small experiment in a real life situation with children and we want to show that video. Jenny and Luca to take the stand.
So I will be presenting on how to keep our brain healthy. So this was supposed to be the last presentation of the day, but we will be continuing with this because of other technical switches. So um, how do we keep our brain healthy? So we often talk about how uh, mental health, mental well-being, and social life, and um, our physical life, our physical body is all important for enjoying a good life or enjoying a good quality lifestyle. But all this, the source of it is the brain. So it is important that we know how to take care of our brain. So let's look at the definition of what a healthy brain is. So brain health is basically the preservation of optimal brain integrity and mental and cognitive function at a given age in absence of overt brain diseases that affect normal brain function. So notice the word preservation here. Preservation means that we have to be continually making certain uh, maintenance. We cannot just keep something away and say that we are preserving it, right? Even if it's an ancient artifact or an art piece, what happens is that we preserve it and keep it in a safe location, but then there is regular maintenance that happens. So even for our brain, in order to uh, enjoy the most optimal peak brain um, health, we have to keep regularly maintaining it. So we are going to be just looking at a few practical tips on how to maintain our brain and of course uh, this is uh, we, uh, when it comes to certain brain diseases or certain brain dysfunctions we have to visit a physician but uh, in case of normal brain development we have to have certain practical uh, uh, certain practical things that we have to keep doing in order to keep it at uh, optimal okay so we are going to be looking at the uh, different methods that we can keep our brain at optimal. So now I also want to emphasize a little bit on the relationship between mental well-being and brain health. Okay, so these are just a few of the studies. There are numerous studies, but I have just picked a few. So it shows that people who score higher on mental health, they also tend to report better memory taking skills. So this is in relation to you college students also. Okay. Uh, and in people in the education sector. Now, uh, when mental well-being is high, episodic memory and executive functioning is also high. Now, when mental well-being is high, mental sharpness is also high. So this is just something that is related to our education sector. That is why I'm emphasizing. Now we will look at um, different ways in which we can keep our brain optimal okay so these are practical tips we are going to be looking at brain and body connectivity we are going to be looking at brain food what sort of food to take we are also going to be looking at brain and sleep connection we are going to be looking at brain and social connectedness we are also at lastly we are also going to be looking at cognitively stimulating activities okay in order to keep our brain uh, healthily stimulated Okay, firstly, looking at brain and body connectivity. I think we have all heard, all of us have been given very various exercise, um, uh, advices on always being active, always being physically active, doing certain sports, exercising, and these are actually true, okay? Uh, so this, uh, a lot of uh, scientific research has gone into this, and a lot of studies have been uh, shown that keeping ourselves active is, uh, Keeping ourselves active improves our neuroplasticity and improves overall mental well-being ex uh, as well as learning outcomes. Okay, so now uh, keeping active need not always be going to the gym and exercising. Okay, of course that is also good, but uh, having a, a physically active lifestyle is also one way you can keep yourself bodily active. Okay. Now, of course, purposeful uh, exercise is also another part of it, and I think we should be doing both. But studies have shown that either one helps in uh, maintaining our uh, cognitive health. 
So uh, now physically active lifestyle includes, uh, for example, walking to college or walking to grocery stores or walking to shops instead of taking the autos or buses and also walking up and down the stairs. I think that's so college all will score very high in this one. So uh, instead of taking the lifts, we can take uh, short walks up to the first floor, uh, I mean to the top floor. Also uh, engaging in hobbies and sports in your various hobbies or household chores, you know some people like gardening, cooking. So all of this uh, contribute towards a physically active lifestyle. Okay, and that is very important for our even our cognitive health also. Okay, now purposeful exercise. I know a lot of you now joining the Zumba and gym. It's free for our teachers and students also. I think. So uh, one thing you can do is you can join the Zumba classes here at that. So you have your basketball. Uh, courts, you have a tennis court, so you can all make use of this. Okay, so brisk walking also includes uh, in purposeful exercise, strength training, aerobics training, all of this come under it. Okay, so I encourage all of you to keep yourself physically active because it helps in your cognitive functioning also. Now coming to brain food, again, you have all heard from your parents, this, that, no, you should have this, you should have this supplements, you should have these vitamins, you should have these fish oils, and they do have truth to it, okay? But of course, we should maintain a balanced diet. Too much of anything is also not good. So these are just a few of the diets which have been found by studies to be effective. So these are the Mediterranean diet the Nordic diet and the Okinawan diet. I'm not, I'm not telling you all to leave your Naga food aside and just follow these diets, but then there are truths to these studies, okay? So you can look at the certain trends that uh, they show in their food habits, okay? So it shows that uh, this Mediterranean diet uh, has ample monosaturated fats, which comes from olive oils, walnuts, all of that, okay? Certain seeds, okay? Uh, now vegetables, fruits, plants, proteins, uh, plant proteins, whole wheat, whole grains and fish and the Nordic diet, uh, it includes fish oils, uh, fish and oils and several types of meat, even meat is important, okay, and specific vegetables, foods and cooking styles. So you know even cooking style has a big part to play in our, uh, in healthy eating, right? So if you eat a vegetable but it's deep fried, it's not as like, effective as if it's sauteed or uh, steamed, right? So you have to keep in mind even cooking styles, okay? Now the Okinawan diet, I think uh, a lot of you have a craze for Korean and Japanese food, right? So this actually has been, um, there. there's a specific island in Japan, okay, where the people there are known for their longevity. So they live very long, okay? That is why scientists have studied their food habits and it has showed that their uh, lifestyle, also physical, as well as their food habits, contributes to their longevity. Okay, so I encourage all of you to have all sorts of fruits and vegetables of all colors. Okay, some people don't like beetroot, but then red is also important. We should have some green vegetables also and some yellow vegetables also. Okay, and now a uh, soy. Uh, legumes, sweet potato, fish, meat, and our favorite rice. Okay, that is also if have if had in a balanced way. Okay, it's good for our health. Okay, so uh, when you are eating, drinking in college, I encourage all of you to keep all of this in mind and make sure that you are enjoying a diverse food. Uh, you are enjoying diverse food. Okay. Now, uh, these are just some uh, research-based um, food recommendations. So I'll just be reading it out, okay? Most of it contributes to uh, uh, our, contributes towards lesser cognitive decline, okay? Now, uh, fish, okay, flax seeds, chia seeds, kiwi fruit, butter, butternuts, walnuts, even turmeric is good, you know, haldi, cocoa. Uh, green tea. Now cocoa is different from chocolate, okay? Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind. <laughs> Don't say that, of course chocolate is also good, but then uh, manufactured stuff usually has a lot of uh, unwanted uh, materials to it also, which is bad for our health, okay? Now, um, kinko, okay, kinko seeds, uh, we might not get it here, but we have, we also, I think if they came and studied in Nagaland, 
we will we also have a wealth of food which are good for our health okay but research is not uh, that uh, not much research has been done so maybe you students will be the one to research on naga food okay so uh, yeah dark chocolate wine uh, butter key uh, lard coconut oil coconut sea palm kernel oil dairy also so these are just things to keep in mind okay so i'm just going to be briefly mentioning about it so spinach olives asparagus avocados nuts spinach vegetable oils wheat gram red palm oil all of these okay liver mushrooms fortified products you might even add now kerala no and what else uh squash leaves no all these are good for our health okay Now we are also going to be looking at brain sleep connection. Okay, so I think this is one part where we fail a lot. So I know a lot of you binge watch and then don't sleep all night and come to college without breakfast. So these are very bad for your health actually and also for your learning. Okay, so you would have noticed that if you have not slept properly or if you did not get adequate nutrition in the morning, you did not eat breakfast, your concentration, your focus, is also poor in your class you would have noticed that in yourself okay so make sure that you are getting adequate sleep okay so studies have shown that seven to eight hours sleep is a good amount of sleep a person should get okay less is also not good more is also not good okay but then again it depends on your various health conditions please take advice from your physician also if you have some sort of sleep disorder okay this is not a uh, i'm not diagnosing you all okay so keep that in mind also now um again we should practice good uh, sleep hygiene okay so in order to have a peaceful sleep you would have noticed that on days where you are um to looking at the screen too much or have drank too much caffeine or you ate very late in the night you do not get good sleep right so make sure that before you sleep you uh, before you sleep you have eaten your dinner way before that okay make sure to avoid caffeine and also keep all your electronic social media phones all of that aside in order to experience more uh, healthy sleep okay now uh, looking at brain and social connectedness okay our growth, our experiences, and some variants of our personality, they are molded through our social engagement, okay? And you know, if the psychology students know that a lot of our, uh, even cognitive development has a lot to do with our social influence also, right? How our so society or our social or our family uh, relations help us in our brain development, no? So this is also important that you uh, engage in meaningful relationships okay uh, so um, people who are uh, lonely okay shows cognitive dis decline also okay and now lonely does not mean that uh, they are always alone that's why okay you can be lonely in a crowd also what is important is that you even if your need to be social is big or small it has nothing to do with extrovert or introvert okay so if you're extrovert maybe you need only one or two or few people to enjoy a good social engagement and if you are an extrovert maybe you need 10 or 20 people or more regular uh, uh, let's say social outing in order to have a meaningful interaction so that is not what I'm uh, emphasizing on okay so even if you are an introvert or an, or an extrovert or, or an ambivert all of us have certain stress uh, thresholds okay so we all need to have our need for affiliation also met in order to enjoy a healthy cognitive and even physical mental mental well-being okay now last but not the least engage in cognitive cognitive uh, least stimulating activities so now that you are in college of course all of us are being intellectually stimulated and we are all actively participating in certain activities which are stimulating our brain so that is one good thing but then make sure to maintain that okay even when you grow older make sure that you are enjoying certain intellectual pursuits you know and you are doing certain mind teaser games so actually sudoku and crossword puzzles all of that has shown to uh, help uh, uh, reduce cognitive decline in even alzheimer's patients okay so uh, make sure that you are engaging in your own 
uh, intellectual pursuits, it need not be Sudoku, okay? But it could be your own different hobbies that you enjoy doing, okay? Cooking, gardening, whatever it is, carpentry, painting, singing, playing musical instruments, all of this also include in uh, uh, mental challenges, okay? So now uh, we hear a lot about uh, this brain teaser game or that game, right? So of course, a certain video games have shown to increase our fluid intelligence and maybe our problem solving activities, okay? Certain video games, but it does not mean that uh, playing video games uh, actually improves our uh, cognitive health also, okay? So keep that in mind, all right? So that is all for my part. So I hope that as you are going on with your day, you remember all of these tips. Okay, thank you. Now. Now uh, I'll give time to uh, Kelly and Lika for their presentation. Good morning everyone. Uh, Lika and I will be presenting on Cognitive Development by John William Fritz Piaget. John William Fritz Piaget was a Swiss psychologist and a genetic epistemologist born on 9th August 1896 in Switzerland. He is widely considered to be the most important figure in the 20th century of developmental psychology. He is famously known for his theory of cognitive development that looked at how children develop intellectually through the course of childhood. His theory of cognitive development has four stages. First, is the sensory motor stage which spans from birth till two years of age. Second is the pre-operational stage from two to seven years and then comes the concrete operational stage which is from seven to eleven years and lastly the formal operational stage which is from twelve years and older. Now we will be watching Piaget's famous conservation task. Hello, my name is Kenny. My name is Lika. John Piaget's theory of cognitive development is a comprehensive theory about the nature and development of human intelligence. Piaget proposed four major stages of cognitive development and called them sensory motor stage, pre-operational stage, concrete operational stage, and formal operational stage. This is a video presentation of the second stage, which is the pre-operational stage. Our subject is a four-year-old girl named Ali. Rows of Pokemon cards, okay? Yes. Now tell me, are you here equal number of cards in each row? Correct. Then, what about now? Which one has more? Mm. So we have two sticks, okay? Yes. Which stick do you think is longer or are they the same? Five. Same. Same. Yes. So now, which one? Which one is longer? This one is longer. Okay. So, here we have two balls of play-doh, okay? Plus. Are they the same? Plus. So, now check this, okay? Ah, uh, which one is bigger? Okay. So, now, do they have equal amount of water? Plus. Okay, so now check this, okay? What about now? Which one has more? Okay. Hello, my name is Kenny. Cognitive development consists of four stages that is sensory motor stage, 
pre-operational stage, complete operational stage, and formal operational stage. And today, we're going to conduct the experiment based on pre-operational stage. And pre-operational stage consists of treatment coming from 2 to 7 years of age. Today, our subject is a very cute friend of ours, Anno, and she is 5 years of age. And we're going to test if she has a blood trip cognitive, conservative, and ability. So basically, conservation in child development is a logical thinking ability to study by three psychologists beyond it. In short, being able to conserve means knowing that a quantity doesn't change if it's been altered. So let's head to that experiment. We have two pencils there at the same time. So tell me which one is longer or both are the same size. Is it the same length? See? Is it the same size? Same size. Okay. So when I pull this one here, now can you tell me which one is longer and which one is shorter? This one is longer. Why? So how many points are there in this right? And what about this line? How many points are there? Five. So, if I do it like this, which one has more points? This or this? This one. Can you count points? Okay, good. And this one? Okay, good. So, which one has more points? This or this? This one. Mm -hmm. So we have these two classes of water. Which class is more water? Or is it the same? Same. Okay. So let me put the water in this cup. Which one is more water? This one. Why? Why do you think it's more water? The level is higher, right? You think, you think so? And this one is more water. From the three experiments that we have conducted today, we can conclude that our subject, Anon, is not able to perform the skill of conservation. That is because she lies in the pre-operational stage. And according to Piaget, children in pre-operational stage cannot perform the skill of conservation. So the uh, pre-operational stage is the second stage under Piaget's cognitive development theory. This stage spans the years two to seven. The most obvious change is an extraordinary increase in representational or uh, symbolic activity. Infants and toddlers' mental representation are impressive, but in early childhood, representational capacities blossom. So we did this conservation task. Let us know what is conservation. Conservation refers to the idea that certain physical characteristics of objects remain the same even when their outward appearance changes. This famous conservation task reveals several deficiencies of pre-operational thinking. We have carried out four conservation tasks to prove this and the child has failed in all the four tasks so the inability to conserve highlights several related aspects of pre-operational children's thinking. First, their understanding is centered or characterized by centration. They focus on only one aspect of the situation and neglect other important features. For example, in the conservation of liquid, the child focuses only on the height of the water and completely dis uh, regarded the the uh, fact that the width of the glass will compensate for the height of the glass. Secondly, children are easily distracted by perceptual appearance of the objects. Third, children ignore the initial and final states of objects as unrelated events, ignoring the dynamic transformation that took place, like pouring of water, flattening of the play-doh, 
and scattering of the cards, etc. So I will be concluding all the topic pre-revision stage. So in this stage, memory and imagination are developing, and uh, at this at this stage, children like uh, children at this stage are egocentric which means they are unable to think outside of their own perspective or viewpoint. So the main achievement of this stage is being able to attach meaning of object with feelings, thinking about things symbolically. So as we saw what our subject already did, our understanding of, concrete, of conservation principle sends her into the world of egocentrism. So she has felt in answering all the questions correctly and because she has not yet attended proper cognitive development as she is still four years old. Piaget concluded that intellectual development is the result of interaction of hereditary and environmental factors so as the child develops constantly interact with the world around him or her, knowledge is reinvented and reinvented. So here I come to the end of our presentation. I hope our presentation was interesting and knowledgeable. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny, Lika, Hamshen, and Moa Manla for a very elaborate and clear presentation. Now, uh, our very own faculty, Ms. Melody Gurumayun Sharma, will be presenting a case of her own client, of a client who has, uh, who is diagnosed with schizophrenia. A very good morning, all the students. Uh, so this case study which I'm going to present is on a case of schizophrenia which was my own client and uh, during the entire assessment it was quite difficult for all the team to come to the conclusion as well because the symptoms were very confusing firstly because when we talk about schizophrenia it's a very big spectrum and we get to have lots of symptoms starting from positive symptoms, negative symptoms. So for this particular case I would say the biggest thing that we could learn from this client was that the theoretical part that we have always read about uh, schizophrenia let's say we have read about paranoid schizophrenia and all so we could really experience in the real life setting how the client felt paranoid about her own family members so i would be presenting atopi history of present illness along with the case formulation and some of the psychological assessments that we have done during the assessment or the intervention period. Okay, I will be, be announcing the winners of the quiz and the winners are <laughs> group 2, Nila Nyo and Hamshen. So you will be winning exciting prizes, which are psychological books, okay? And uh, even our fifth semester students, the answers you have uh, given are all correct. So you will also be winning uh, consolation prizes. <laughs> okay, um, so uh, you can leave the stage.